Um, as David said, I thought what I'd do today is, is really try and uh, talk about some of the work that we've been doing in the last four or five years uh, that came out of a lot of my um, model organism work, but was also particularly accentuated by uh, taking on a, a division leadership role and recognizing uh, that translational research uh, was beginning to uh, change dramatically. Um, and in that context, I thought I would uh, try and tell you a little bit about what we've been trying to do to bring the fundamental uh, translational and clinical sciences together in a way that I believe is, is going to be driven by outs outside forces much more rapidly than it's being driven by forces inside traditional medicine. Uh, my disclosures are, are here. Uh, probably the most relevant one is the one at the very bottom because it's the one that you can't measure. Uh, overwhelming and unbridled academic self-interest. Uh, which, again, I think is one of the things that uh, comes to the core of what I'm going to talk about, which is how do we choose what to measure uh, and how do we actually measure it? Uh, this is a, a sort of um, nexus of the problem, I believe. These are two competing visions. Uh, precision medicine, I think, uh, was first in vogue as molecular medicine when I left uh, the Hammersmith in 1985. Uh, and yet we still haven't really managed to get beyond the strategy of treating large populations that are aggregated and pulling out different responders. We maybe even pull out those responders, but then don't change the way in which we use the drug. And so this concept, uh, which is becoming, again, more and more uh, prevalent and more and more um, uh, obvious in our culture, even if only because of federal mandates, uh, is something that's taken a long time to realize. At the same time, in the rest of um, medicine, we're talking about accumulating huge amounts of data, about deep learning, about artificial intelligence. Topics that, again, have been around outside medicine for about uh, 30 or 40 years. The first time that uh, Walmart used machine learning was in 1986 uh, to manage their supply chain. And in fact, the current electronic health records resemble closely Walmart's uh, 1986 software platform. Uh, one of the most interesting things, and this is superimposed on Clay Christensen's diagram, this was a, an article from Forbes, is that we spent about a decade and a half trying to get technology, trying to get uh, modern um, wearable uh, physiologic monitoring, trying to take things from the hospital into the home or into the outpatient setting. And all we've really done is increase costs. We've turned each of us from uh, a provider into a, a data, data entry clerk uh, that now occupies about half, if not more, of every visit. Uh, is actually a digital data entry. Uh, and there are a lot of fundamental reasons for this, but what I'm going to try and, and go through is some of the, the core rationale about redesigning uh, what we do in healthcare so that it's actually organized around the biology of the patient rather than around legacy systems of delivery of care that in the main usually antedate um, most of our biological insight and are actually based in many ways on social constructs from the 1800s for how senior physicians used to like to visit uh, hospitals. <coughs> so what's actually wrong with current disease definitions? Well, um, traditional healthcare really is a very expectant business. We wait for people to show up um, and when they do, uh, we fit them into categories that are largely defined 30, 40, 50 years ago. Uh, and then we um, begin to treat them using a series of fairly rapidly evolving treatment guidelines until uh, we observe the sort of ultimate therapeutic trajectory. We don't really spend a lot of time on the details of that. That's why the precision medicine that was in the first slide has not really been enacted. Uh, and evolving treatment guidelines is actually an interesting point because they evolve quite fast, but they implement incredibly slowly. So for example, the average time from something uh, with mortality benefit reaching the guidelines in cardiology to actually reaching equilibrium in the population is somewhere between 12 and 15 years. So that's, I think, an embarrassment, if nothing else, an indictment, if you put it more strongly, when you think that most uh, software upgrades on the planet occur 48 hours after the release of the software. But it takes us uh, 15 years to get our acts together. And the rate limiting step in this has actually been studied quite well. I won't show you any of the data because I think you probably all know it. It's actually education and promulgation of physicians. And you're completely dependent in the medical system on who you see, when you see them, whether they have enough time to enact uh, the, the most up-to-date therapy or whether they've even heard about the most up-to-date therapy. 
what um, in cardiology I think we've been quite good at is moving the, the uh, needle a little bit backwards into prevention. There's some other areas that have done similarly well, uh, particularly in cancer screening. But again, what we're, we're still focused on is those early stages of deviation from health. Um, and ultimately, the way that we've set up the whole system with people coming to us rather than us actually collecting data from them really is what's preventing uh, care delivery system evolution. And that actually is fundamentally important for the final part of my talk, which really is how do we bring those things together. So current disease definitions um, are really very analog. They fail to discriminate um, uh, or to eliminate the major um, system costs. In fact, we, it was almost by design we've built most of medicine around us. We've held on with uh, white knuckles to things that are no longer professional, things that in any other industry would have been devolved, not just to the consumer, but to their, uh, their stable electronic um, hardware in the home. Uh, there are very few data that we use to identify patients at the correct point in therapeutic trajectory. We don't use any of the information that we collect. Uh, to be honest, a lot of what we collect in the, in the electronic record is semi-subjective at best uh, and, and voodoo uh, at worst. <laughs> Uh, there's very limited real-world data or experience. We've all, again, we've almost resisted that. We've said, you know, we can't, can't possibly learn anything from the system in which you're actually delivering the care. Unlike every other industry on the planet where R&D is actually part of the business. Uh, and then finally, uh, in the last couple of points, uh, there's a lot of learned behavior. We've taught patients to behave in certain ways, and that is probably best seen by the wide variation in care. So, for example, atrial fibrillation in Scotland is a primary care outpatient disorder. In the U.S., it's uh, an inpatient ICU disorder if your heart rate is above about 110. Um, there's very limited um, availability of any infrastructure for actually delivering the care. Uh, for collecting the data and for processing the data in any meaningful way. And then finally, a lot of this, I think, is uh, held up to the shibboleth of, of regulatory hurdles. We hold that as a, as a barrier to everything that we do, but we don't make really much effort to try and change it. <clears throat> we recently spent $1.5 billion implementing EPIC across the partner system, that's Mass General and the Brigham and McLean. Um, and I co-led the research um, uh, component of, uh, of the advisory councils on this. And one of the things that we learned was that essentially most, and I'm sure you've all learned this, but it's worth pointing these things out because, again, most people learned them when they first introduced the EHR 10, 12, 15 years ago, but have not really done much about them. That having an EHR is really only a small part of the transformation needed. There's almost no redesign of workflow. So what we've done is digitize 18th century workflow, 18th century endpoints, and we've bolted things onto the side. Uh, there's no other uh, organization on the planet where software actually increases the workload and increases the cost <laughs> of doing the work. It wouldn't be implemented if that were the case. Uh, data acquisition is still completely provider-based, uh, and everything um, is focused on transactions, not on the biology. Uh, there are huge cha challenges ahead. Standardization, this is a, something I ask everybody to think about. You can think of anything other than the 12 liter electrocardiogram and the international normalized ratio that has a global standard by the end of the lecture. I'll actually pay you money because I don't think there is a single thing. Um, data management and visualization are literally um, antediluvian. They're based, again, we, we had this amazing uh, feature where after a year and a half of EPIC, Everybody, the main request back from the providers was to have the labs displayed in the fishbone. So we had to literally go back and re-engineer uh, something from the written record so that it would display the labs in a format that people thought they needed on rounds. Um, there's almost no intuitive decision support in, in standard EHRs. We removed uh, over 55% of the clinical decision support that we had in place when we introduced EPIC. And ultimately, the EHR turns out to be probably our biggest competition. They're collecting the data that we actually need in order to be able to do what we really want to do. Uh, interestingly, from the research standpoint, it was actually quite a powerful difference. Um, the research community is probably, of all the people in uh, the partner system, most engaged in leveraging what we can do with EHR. The single system they immediately recognized had the power to improve recruitment, to bring synergies between different groups. We now will, every time a research proto protocol comes up, it goes through both Mass General and the Brigham. Um, and also it allows us to begin to think about standardization. There's no standardization of the uh, documentation of conditions by default in the clinical record. Uh, 
but you have to have that in the research record. So what's actually driving the standardization of, of uh, coding is not perish the thought population health management, but actually research projects and individual codes. Um, we've introduced um, a lot of uh, programs to try and improve recruitment. We now have over 5,500 studies active in the HR, over 300,000 subjects enrolled in the last 12 months, uh, and a whole slew of, of order sets that are essentially built into the clinical care. But the difficult things uh, are also outlined here. It's very tough to balance enterprise scale while preserving uh, individual creativity, and I think that's something, obviously, that as a profession we're going to have to think about. And then I think perhaps the, the most important conclusion from my two years of doing this, and I think probably most people have realized this wrong before that, is there is absolutely no way that we as a society can afford a separate system for doing research and clinical care, whether that's fundamental research, translational research, or clinical research. It all has to be built into the same platform. We cannot be rolling out and building up infrastructure and then uh, cycling it out uh, at the end of a project. Uh, we just simply can't afford to spend one and a half billion dollars in a research platform to parallel our clinical platform. And at the core of all of this, uh, I think, um, and I'm going to make the case, but obviously it's up for some debate, it's certainly the case in the world that I work in, which is genetics and genomics, but I believe it's also the case in care redesign and clinical trials, is that the phenotypes, the things we measure, are the rate-limiting step that we've almost designed them so that we have to be involved. We've almost designed them so that we have to be part of the equation. Uh, if you were thinking about how you would build an electronic health record, all the information would already be there before the patient came into the room, and you would be adding professional input instead of actually adding the information that you need in order to deliver that microcosm of professional input in the last 30 seconds. So in genetics, we've spent a lot of time, if you look up on the very top left-hand corner, looking at very large disease genes, so very rare families with hundreds of people in them. We've done a lot of work on common traits, small effect alleles, that even if you add the top 100 disease genes that were identified or disease loci identified for diabetes, they only account for about 20% of the heritable risk. But the reality is we've known, we've known since epidemiology started that most common traits in medicine, most of the things that actually cause problems are in the middle, they're in that diagonal. There are things that either we don't measure because we haven't really bothered to try, uh, or we haven't thought about how we could measure them, or there are things that are dependent on a conditioning variable. And we measure almost no conditioning variables, with the exception of alcohol and tobacco. Uh, and so fundamentally, the way that we've thought about collecting information is so skewed against us being able to del deliver a system that works that it's not surprising that it, we have one that doesn't work. Um, the same is true for clinical genomics. I, um, I'm the clinical lead in the Undiagnosed Diseases Program at the Harvard sites. Um, and this is basically designed to try and use genomic sequencing to solve cases in smaller families. And what we invariably find is there are four or five genes that look like they have variants that might be deleterious in them, but there's no biology known about any of those genes, and there's no biology known about the patient. We don't know if you come in with a with a, a nasty cardiomyopathy, we don't know if it's, if it, what the actual mechanism of the disorder is. We've literally classified it as big heart, small heart, or normal sized heart. That's literally the way in which we think about things. Stuff that in any other setting would be embarrassing. Um, clinical trials, um, again, I mentioned at the start, I think the same is still the case for a variety of commercial and intellectual reasons. We've failed to stratify patients to actually make those trials relevant. And I think it's all coming to head in care redesign where there are now multiple, multiple trials taking measurements that we made in the hospital for years and didn't really find particularly helpful, moving them to the home. And then we're absolutely stunned that in randomized control trials, measuring oxygen saturation, weight, which we know even a controlled setting is almost meaningless, heart rate, which has a thousand things that control it, uh, and blood pressure, that that doesn't help us reduce heart failure readmissions or, uh, or change outcomes. It's not surprising. Everything is either static or very limited in its dynamic range. Blood pressure is a great example. If you were going to pick something to measure, and it's not, I'm not being critical of the treatment of blood pressure, I'm just saying, think about it. The, the breath to breath variation in the trait is greater uh, than the, the difference between the first and last centiles in the population. And the largest treatment effect is less than the accuracy of the technique. What, what other field would we allow that to happen in? And we've done that partly because, and this is, again, another theme that I think emerges, is that we're, we're sort of caught in this trap because all of our implementation is based on things that we know already are archaic or arcane. 
and we haven't really thought, how do we move everything forward together? We move the research forward, and then nothing happens in the clinical care for decades uh, to come. Uh, this is probably best illustrated here, uh, the, the phenotype gap. If you uh, do, and we did this, we added every single billable phenotype in North American medicine together, and it comes out to about 9,800 9, variables. And that includes about 60 diastolic func dysfunction parameters. Um, and you look at all of these, and you have a scale that's off by four or five log orders from what you would need to deconvolute genomics alone. Uh, and it's worth pointing out, the other thing that's interesting about a genome is it's the only bounded data set in the entire biomedical sphere. There's no other data set that is truly bounded. So you don't really know anything in terms of the scope of what the phenotype looks like or could look like. Uh, transcription, proteomics, connections between individual cells, physiology, timescales that go from microseconds through to decades. Again, none of that really very well documented or characterized. And then exposures on the bottom left-hand corner uh, monumentally under-interrogated uh, in ways that are difficult to actually explain. Uh, so we need to move beyond some of these legacy phenotypes. The EHR, I think, is, is literally uh, unstructured data, uh, semi-subjective, as I mentioned at best, and largely duplicative. A lot of it is actually cut and paste. Um, there's a, a monumental lack of standardization. Um, there are no metadata. You know, your heart rate at 30, uh, heart rate of 30 doesn't really tell you anything unless you know what else is happening. We haven't thought about doing this. And largely because of the, the pressures of implementation, there's a huge threshold for innovation in this area. Uh, and in many instances, this is because of the fact that we need an evidence base that's tied to implementation in order to move forward. So think about uh, troponin, for example. So troponin went from being essentially a way to exclude an acute coronary syndrome to now being almost universally used in every EW patient. Almost everybody who comes through the ER gets a troponin as if it was a diagnosis in its own right. And that happened against our uh, best interests because of the fact that it was tied to implementation. So the good things we keep away from implementation, and then on the other side, we let other variables, simply because of economic pressures, uh, end up driving uh, the entire disease definition in, in a completely aberrant direction. So how do we think about doing this? This is another example of just what you might begin to do where you to think about diabetes. So I mean, it's another good example, tasting urine from the Middle Ages. That's how we ended up with the definition of diabetes. We've known for almost, the top slide is actually from Rob Gerson's work, we've known for almost uh, a decade uh, that about a decade before there's any abnormality of glucose tolerance or any abnormality uh, of blood or um, uh, uh, urinary glucose, that there are amino acid abnormalities in uh, a significant subset of individuals, probably about 30% of people with diabetes. But that has not made it to the clinic, largely because all of the therapies are tied to blood sugar. And there's no way of overcoming that. There's no way of potentially identifying people or using it epidemiologically or thinking about how we might use it therapeutically because none of the connections have been made. So the, the thought would be that if we began to make some of those connections, moving phenotyping earlier and earlier in disease, we might be able to map the old onto the new. And one of the things I do think it's very important for us not to do is to get rid of the old. We're not going to be able to start from scratch, but we need to think much more logically about how we move things forward. <clears throat> one of the things that we began to ask ourselves, uh, and this is partly why I actually began a lot of these projects, was in, um, in work that we were doing in zebrafish, trying to integrate from genetics all the way up to the final integrate fully, full organism phenotype. And if you think about the things that you can do, that you can apply all the way from a single molecule right the way up to a population, there are very few variables that actually are, can be standardized at that scale, except for small molecules, drugs, uh, or nutrition. Uh, and uh, biophysical challenges. And so we began then to build a set of phenotyping tools that would be based on the dynamic responses to small molecules or to biophysical challenges. And this is obviously a slow process. I'm not going to be able to show you much data uh, about how far we've gotten. But the other thing that's worth pointing out is that this requires completely new approach to thinking about how you define uh, the data you collect, uh, the way you put it together, and the taxonomy that you use. Uh, and importantly, also, you have to balance at each stage the breadth versus the depth. It has to be practically useful. Uh, the other thing that this does by default is it links clinical and basic science. Um, if you think about it, we know we can take a, 
uh, the genome from a plant and understand what the gene does or the parallel gene does in a human. Uh, but we have almost no phenotypes that do the same thing. There are no perturbations that you could say, uh, well, light does this to a plant. What does it do to, uh, to a human? Um, although I'm pretty certain that there are very much shared pathways between plants and humans in terms of their responses to light. There are lots of oxytrophic pathways that have been documented in almost every uh, animal model that have been looked at. Nobody's really looked at them in humans. So what we need is actually the two columns on the, on the right, phenotypes that actually go all the way from single cell right the way up to uh, population and perturbations that do the same. And again, obviously, the other thing that's very important is that things don't just go from the bottom up, but come from the top down. And there, I think drugs actually end up being one of the important tools that we've really failed to use. So what I believe we need uh, are multiple dimension phenotypes that improve specificity. An example I like to give here is if you think about blood glucose in diabetics, it has a mean of about 135. Um, but, uh, and if you look at the distribution of it, it's completely Gaussian. If you pull out one <clears throat> standardized variable, and I told you there are no other standardized variables uh, in uh, medicine except for uh, uh, I, INR and ECG, but there are outside medicine, it turns out you can begin to pull out the Mendelian forms. So uh, that standardized uh, variable is shoe size. So five of the, the known Mendelian forms of diabetes are either dwarfisms or, or gigantisms. It turns out if you know height and shoe size, you can pretty reliably identify those individuals from a diabetic population where their blood sugar has no discriminatory power whatsoever to discriminate uh, the underlying mechanism. Now that's a trite example, but again, it's just designed to show you how far off the mark we are in terms of the biologies that we actually put together. One of the other things that we learned in this space that actually I thought was quite uh, um, interesting is that if you look at animal models, they often have insights that you can very rapidly translate back to, to humans. Uh, there's only two zebrafish slides in this, so don't worry. But we, we um, actually modeled uh, Naxos syndrome, which is a disorder of desmosomes characterized by sudden death, heart failure, and palmoplantar plantar keratoderma and curly hair. We found fairly quickly when we were studying the fish that they had abnormalities of sodium channel at the intercalated disc. Uh, we did a drug screen and we identified a small molecule that actually allowed us to show that uh, this was actually a function of trafficking abnormalities from the uh, um, subcellular uh, compartments in which uh, proteins are glycosylated back to the membrane. When we did that, we started to look at other excitable tissues for phenotypes in these patients. And we actually found abnormalities of skin conductance, uh, of auditory evoked response, uh, and of stride lines in these patients and in other heart failure patients. But perhaps the most uh, embarrassing thing was that we were able, and this was work that was actually done by somebody else, but we, we had originally uh, stimulated the, the uh, question, they, that the primary pathology is actually demonstrable in buccal smears from people with arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. Uh, and in fact, you can actually show the drug response in a cover slip from those buccal smears. So again, suggesting that if we just look more broadly for phenotypes, we might be able to find orthogonal data that actually inform diagnosis in each and every patient that we look after. So in the uh, project that we are doing uh, as part of the AHA, um, Verily, and it was AstraZeneca was the, uh, the third partner, we're beginning to look for very early diagnoses in coronary disease. A lot of what's happened in coronary disease has been amazing. We've changed the equations dramatically uh, for survival by, through both uh, stenting and, and uh, the drugs involved in, uh, in regulating lipids and inflammation statins, and most recently PCSK9 inhibitors. But interestingly, there have been data that uh, coronary disease is detectable in teenagers uh, present for, for many decades, since the Vietnam War, to be honest. Uh, and we haven't really tried to build technologies that would identify the disorder in those settings. It turns out that's quite important for a couple of reasons. Uh, the biggest problem in genetics of coronary disease is actually making a negative diagnosis. So about 30% of the people who are in control populations in most coronary disease uh, cohorts actually have coronary disease but have not yet developed any of the manifestations of the underlying disorder. And so this would actually, just by simply being able to make negative diagnoses, allow us to improve the genetic resolution of existing populations. The other thing that we think we would be able to do is to build new ways to detect coronary disease non-invasively much, much uh, earlier, or even to stratify populations much, much later, so that we could begin to match risk uh, and therapy. Uh, 
Uh, and ideally, what this would allow us to do is to optimize the management of individual patients. The other thing that we'd really like to do um, eventually is actually to build a framework that would allow this to be a sort of digital physical exam, where you wouldn't have to enter the data. It would simply be uh, uploaded directly. Um, are there new pathways feasible in atherosclerosis? Well, it turns out the LDL hypothesis, I think, has been very successful. Uh, but on this right side, you can see the abnormalities that have been shown already to be present in children, and yet we have not systematically gone after in um, normal biology. So there are actually abnormalities of vascular patterning that are present in many animal models of atherosclerosis based on the uh, LDL receptor loss of function genes, uh, LDL receptor and other loss of function genes. Uh, Cholesterol accumulates in the skin, but we wait for it to be visible to the naked eye. We haven't actually built any technologies that would allow us to detect it earlier. Uh, there are vasomotor abnormalities that have been uh, present in coronary disease um, and known to be present in the teenage relatives of those with coronary disease uh, since the late 80s, but partly because the technologies are not available uh, and partly because uh, they, the stimuli are not really very well understood. We haven't implemented that at scale. And then finally, um, statin response is still the best predictor of outcomes in coronary disease. We never use statins as a, as a challenge. Why would we not even try using statins in people who are younger as a single dose challenge to see if we can uh, identify biology that actually predicts uh, long-term disease? And so what we're doing is building technologies to do each of these. The other thing that's worth pointing out is that if you just put in the LDL receptor, ApoB, and PCSK9, the three of the four uh, major genes that have been identified as causing Mendelian forms of coronary disease into protein interaction networks or genetic interaction networks from the fly, from Drosophila or from worm that were established maybe 15 or 20 years ago. It immediately predicts that you would see hypertension, type 2 diabetes, and uh, cognitive uh, disorders as part of the same syndromes. So you could have predicted a lot of the epidemiologic associations just from uh, interactions in invertebrate organisms. So what we're doing is essentially trying to build uh, technologies, not just to measure um, uh, the things that I discussed, because obviously that would be almost uh, um, uh, um, a direct corollary of where we are at the moment, but actually to begin to try and fill out three-dimensional space. So we're actually in this bottom diagram taking cells and trying to understand what are the cellular phenotypes that uniquely identify disease entities. And so, uh, for example, there are a number of uh, approaches that have been done in very rare diseases with this, uh, using this strategy where they've been found to be abnormalities of particular um, uh, nuclear hormone uh, receptor pathways simply based on the responses seen in cell culture. And that then turned out to be the case uh, in more common disease. And so by building things, uh, technologies that can measure these types of processes uh, in, in vivo and ideally in a, initially in an outpatient clinic, we can begin to then build the evidence base and move it efficiently to validation in cohorts uh, and validation uh, in uh, other populations. The goal would be to develop a more generalizable uh, strategy for discovering new phenotypes. Instead of relying on what's gone on in the last um, couple of hundred years, to actually move beyond that, to build on it, but move into an agnostic approach to phenotyping, trying to classify things based on actual cell biology peroxisome abnormalities, mitochondrial abnormalities, not just in people who have mitochondrial disease or peroxisome disease. And trying to do that in a way that leads rapidly to validation in existing patient cohorts through to uh, perturbation phenotype combinations. I think that's ultimately the thing that we're going to really require is to understand how things vary uh, in response to a challenge. That's a much better way of anchoring big data uh, than any of the things that we've tried uh, in, in other settings. And then finally, the goal would be to build large cohorts that actually ha have the ability to uh, democratize phenotyping so that everybody can participate and we're not just dependent on uh, the individuals who happen to make it into a large randomized trial. We're building a fairly large uh, translational infrastructure to do this with uh, cycles of uh, innovation and refinement um, based in MIT, building new devices, scaling them, refining them, and moving them forward. But ultimately, what we're trying to do is think about how we can move this into implementation. So in parallel, what we've done is build platforms that actually deliver care without providers, because we realize that that's probably the only way to eliminate the variability, is to actually say, are there slices of care where we can get rid of all of the provider involvement, 
reduce cost, improve uniformity, and then build essentially a research network on the back end to use the data that we're collecting to allow us to identify compliance, to allow us to identify physiologic transitions, to allow us to identify drug responses in real time as part of the patient's care. And so that's actually uh, what we've begun to do using uh, the, ideally the, the strategy of moving back from this right side of the diagram all the way to the left, collecting better data, allowing us to move progressively beyond uh, the uh, preventative strategies into the earliest transitions from wellness. And in practical terms, we've actually done this in a variety of different ways. So in the inpatient setting, we've been using traditional sources, EHR, uh, waveform data and patient reported outcome measures. But we've actually found that non-traditional data may be much more important. That things like the chatter in the electronic health record is actually a better predictor of risk than the number of times the alarm goes off. Uh, that uh, social connectivity, whether people are calling their relatives, is a better index of their disease state uh, than many of the things that we actually measure. And in fact, interestingly, in the outpatient heart failure programs, one of the things that did actually predict whether or not somebody would be readmitted post hoc, uh, albeit, was uh, the number of uh, a change in the connectivity between the patient and their care network. So if they called more or less, it was actually a predictor of readmission with heart failure, whereas all of the physiology was essentially null in that setting. So a lot of different things where you might begin to put these data sources into a setting uh, where they could actually inform transitions of care, and we believe this is the highest value context where if you can show that you can just even predict how long somebody's going to be in an ICU, you're in much better shape uh, for actually affecting uh, the value to the system than if you try and boil the ocean uh, by building a completely new platform. In the outpatient setting, what we've done, and we've done now the top four of these, uh, lipids and inflammation, hypertension, and heart failure, is to build programs that actually implement directly to the patient. Uh, without any provider involvement. These are run by navigators who are actually uh, uh, college graduates. We're now actually re reappraising that and wondering if we should be using high school graduates. Uh, this is actually something that has been done in other settings in other countries. Uh, they use an algorithm that's behind the wall that helps them plug the data in and then decide what to do next. The nice thing about this is you can give the algorithm to the patient who's digitally savvy, but you can manage the 85-year-old lady over the phone, and you can not only that uh, do that, but also give them the social con uh, connectivity that they require in order to actually maintain their therapy. And so we're, uh, we're finished pilots in lipids and inflammation, with, uh, in the middle of a pilot in hypertension, in the middle of a pilot uh, on heart failure, uh, and now moving into prediabetes and diabetes, uh, peripheral artery disease, arrhythmias, and anticoagulation. And the goal is to do it in, in this exact format. So it's, we identify the patient population, usually using a combination of uh, um, natural language processing and the, and the data types in the record. The sad thing is that the data in the record are actually amazingly poorly uh, informative. So the insurance companies only know the billing codes and the pharmacy only knows the drugs. And just by simply putting those together with a couple of basic pieces of information for the patient, you turn out to increase the leverage uh, for the management of the patient dramatically, but the value of the data also increases substantially. So you can imagine what would happen if you actually had objective data connecting the, all of these components. It would be incredibly powerful. The other thing that we like to do is try and build into each of these a return cycle where we're actually measuring drug response so that we know in a granular way, not just how did your, what is your LDL today, but how did it get there? Which statin did you take? How long were you on it? What was your response to it? What happened when we added ezetimibe? What happened if you actually needed a PCSK9 inhibitor? So that you can begin then to have not just uh, cross-sectional data, but actually trajectory data on every patient in your network. And the goal with this is ultimately to um, uh, essentially evolve it in slices to act, to act as a platform. We've done this actually with multiple different partners. I'm not going to go through this slide in any detail. It's really just designed to show you that if you start to do this, there are lots of potential uh, uh, partners for this going forward. Payers obviously have uh, discrete interest in this. Uh, pharmacy benefit managers have a huge interest in it. And for them, actually, their main revenue stream is not the management of the patient. It's actually foot traffic through the pharmacy. So adding a research component to their business turns out to uh, have massive added value for them. Uh, technology companies, pharma, biotech, obviously in consortia to deconflict it. Uh, retail. Um, one of the saddest things I think that I, I recognized is that the retail industry is way ahead of us 
in thinking about this. There are many, many retailers that are beginning to think about healthcare as one of the major areas where they will begin to operate. Uh, they're, they're building loyalty programs that are based on nutrition that's essentially driven by phenotypic features that are collected uh, at the cash register or in imagery at the uh, entry to the store. And then finally, we've actually uh, had the federal government get involved in this because what they're really interested in is at attributing value to the individual steps of care. So ultimately, I think, um, and this I think is the last slide, um, I think the way that we see this uh, happening is if we can build definitive implementation infrastructure and build true discovery and monitoring infrastructure together, it turns out we can begin to accelerate the movement of biology into the clinic in a really different way. Uh, and ultimately, everything that we do is part of the same fundamental goal for society. Um, the real driver for this is if we don't do it, other people are going to do it for us. And that's the thing that I think will make it this different than 1985 when I first heard about precision medicine. We've sort of let this go on for, well, how long ago was 1985? It feels like it was only about a decade ago. But unfortunately, it was about 30 years ago. Um, but fundamentally, what, we've, what we have allowed to happen is we've allowed things to get so far out of control that retail chains have a better chance of making a global healthcare system than we do. Uh, and they will do it whether we like it or not. There are now multiple different um, consulting reports that suggest that a third of US AMCs will fail by 2025. And the reason they'll fail is there just won't be any work for them to do. Um, so fundamentally, if we don't do it, somebody else will. And that's really what actually drove me to begin to think about how to do this is I run uh, a division that actually has an amazing uh, dependence on research uh, for its long-term viability. So if we don't get embedded in a meaningful way in this, uh, in, a, in a way that lasts for 30 or 40 years, we will be uh, out of business in, in a major way. So in summary, I think the central issues in biomedicine are related to disease information content. We need systematic approaches to really improve that information content that are based just not just on the biology of the patient, but also in the way that we change our workflow around them. This ultimately will enable the integration of care and discovery, which, let's face it, is the, is the mission of academic medicine, mission of all medicine, to be honest. And this is the actual opportunity to design a framework uh, for both holistic care and probabilistic biomedicine in exactly the same platform. So thank you for your attention. Um, just a reminder that at the end, we're also going to be presenting the Medical Student Award, so we do have plenty of time for questions, but also stick around for the end of the session today. Hi, Catherine Otto. Hi, this is a very interesting talk. I mean, it's very, you know, like forward-looking and um, a vision of the future. I'm kind of having a hard time understanding how this would actually work in daily practice. So like your example of you're having this uh, high school graduate manage the patient's lipids and inflammation. I mean, that, the patient, I presume, still interacts with a person and gets some medication. So, I mean, is this high school graduate prescribing it? Could you kind of explain, like, the details of how does that actually so work? The way, so there's a pharmacist runs the program. Who In Massachusetts, you can actually cede uh, prescription rights to the pharmacist. But remember, in many countries, statins are available over the counter. Uh, so, you know, I think a lot of, a lot of what we do is, is based on the fact that we imagine we're adding enormous value. You know, if, if I went to see a physician and he asked me 10 questions that I could have asked myself, and he takes my report as gospel, and then he writes me a prescription, he asks me to come back six weeks later to have my LFTs and my CK checked, and then I have to make an appointment to come back and have the dose changed, and then I miss that appointment because I'm busy in my work, and then nine months later, my LDL is still 190, uh, I wouldn't be very satisfied. So in fact, what we did was to take a 1,000 patients from a, a major payer in Massachusetts and to essentially say, okay, we will manage this for you uh, using this program. We showed them exactly what the structure would be. We'll eliminate specialty pharmacy. We'll eliminate the costs of provider visits. We'll eliminate uh, the costs of uh, uh, um, all of the communication that goes around those provider visits. And we will do it only with the primary care doctor's consent. Um, and so we took uh, those 1,000 patients. And at the moment, I think the, the data are that so these were people who had been in the medical system with a documented indication for a statin, uh, 
or for lipid lowering for over nine months and were not at goal. And we got over 92% of them at goal within five weeks with this program. Uh, we're still working on the maintenance phase. Uh, but ultimately, the patients actually, uh, patient satisfaction was astronomically high. They like it because they can talk to somebody every day. They don't have to wait six weeks to get in touch with somebody. They can actually meet somebody. We had only one person who ended up having to see a physician based on objective criteria uh, that were predetermined. Um, there are automated uh, um, programs for checking CK, for checking LFTs. Uh, there was an automated transition to the next step if you hadn't reached goal after a particular uh, period of time. Uh, and the providers, the primary care doctors, were absolutely ecstatic because essentially it took all of that uh, extra volume out of their day-to-day -day care. So they were actually the most, uh, if you look at the sort of satisfaction, it was a pretty tight race between primary care providers um, and uh, patients. But ultimately, it's just a matter of overcoming some of the, the legalities. We have, to, we have to work our way around this regulatory space because the reality is we're not doing a good job. Uh, and we're not doing a good job largely because we've held on to things that are just not professional behavior. You know, if you, if you literally have trained for 14 years and what you're doing is just changing the dose of a drug that you've already decided is indicated, that's a stunning indictment of how poorly we've matched the training to the system. And in fact, the, the reality of it is actually um, even worse than that, that we're not, we're not actually any good at doing the things that require systems to do them. It's quite frightening. You know, it's almost, I don't honestly understand how we've let it happen. I certainly, I looked at the volume, so all of the, the transactions at Brigham and Women's Outpatient Cardiology, 40% of them, the only thing that happens is the visit itself. And so that actually turns out, just from a revenue standpoint, we make more money on the parking than we do on the transaction. <laughs> so there's, and, and then we wonder why we don't have time to spend on the complicated, nuanced aortic stenosis patient or the, the difficult to judge um, un, you know, um, rare case. It's because we're spending all of our time doing busy work that's not in any way professional. And I, I mean, I totally hear you. There's a lot of hurdles to overcome. But I think if we don't try, we're never, we're going to be stuck in this situation where we're managing, uh, you know, nuanced things that turn out to be counting the angels on the head of a pin rather than actually truly transforming care. Uh, Cal, that was a wonderful and provocative talk. Um, in listening to, listening to it, there are two issues that immediately come to mind. One is the issue of privacy. Now, how do you get the patients to opt in for this? Is there some sort of blanket consent just from being seen in the system? And then uh, the other issue is reimbursement because, um, you know, what's going to pay for all the high school students to do all these things? So uh, it turns out the even if you, so I'll answer the second question first. So the, the system as a whole saves 63% uh, of the current cost. So if you map out how long it takes to get uh, a, an insured patient in Massachusetts to go using the current system on average, uh, it is somewhere around uh, $1,000, not quite, it's about $996. Uh, we can get people, as I mentioned, to go in weeks instead of months for uh, a third of that cost. And so, you know, ultimately, I think it's actually the opposite. I think it's how can you afford not to be doing stuff like this? From the standpoint of privacy, um, there, you know, there, there's just exactly the same uh, um, provider uh, patient uh, uh, confidentiality that exists uh, in every other setting. This all goes back into the electronic health record. The primary care doctor is fully informed about everything that's happening. Uh, we don't breach cons uh, 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 confidentiality in any way. Uh, whatsoever. Actually, the other thing that's interesting about confidentiality, again, I know I'm a little bit uh, heretical in this, but actually I think if you think about what people are willing to give out if they know they're getting value in return. I mean, how many times in the last month have you given somebody your credit card information? When was the last time you gave your social security number? You do it under circumstances where you know you need to do it to get something in return. In healthcare, that, there's very little documentation of what the, the value add and return is. And I think if we improve that, then a lot of the privacy issues become much less uh, important. I would far rather have my genome on the web and my medical record on the web if it meant that I got my, uh, you know, my therapy that reduces my mortality by 30%. Sometime in the first year, it was known to reduce mortality by 30% than waiting until the 12th year. Um, of its um, availability. So I think people are willing to make those trade-offs.
if you actually just give it to them in, in quantitative fashion. Thank you for that great talk. Um, I, as a primary care provider, I can see the role for autom um, automation in disease management involving others in care because, frankly, it's sort of overwhelming to do that all on your own. Um, but I'm curious if you could speak more about this wellness phase and yeah. this pre-disease care. How do we engage patients and what is our role in so, pushing things back? So this is actually, I think, the, the thing that's at the core of all of this is that it doesn't replace the provider-patient relationship. It essentially returns it to a professional relationship. That instead of being the data entry clerk, guess what? You're actually getting to know the patient while they're well. You're understanding their social context. You're building a relationship with them that allows you to be an advocate for them 20, 30 years down the line. Um, and so that actually is a critical piece of it. The, the way that we do that, or the way we, I mean, again, all of these pieces, I think this is what's been the difficulty in medicine is we, we're waiting for the perfect system to show up fully formed. And it's just not gonna do that. We have to actually build it in little slices. And that's essentially what we recognized we had to do. The stimulus for every one of those slices is a change in therapy that primary care was not comfortable managing. So in, at least in Massachusetts, lipid management was no longer a cardiology um, uh, activity. PCSK9 inhibitors came out and we started getting this huge wave of referrals because nobody knows how, really how to manage PCSK9 inhibitors. It's an antibody, it's given weekly or quarterly or monthly, nobody, you know, there's a whole new series of questions that people weren't familiar with. So we had to build something to handle that. In addition to that, we're starting to say, okay, how do we begin to engage people much, much earlier in life? So for example, one of the partnerships we have with a retailer is to begin to use non-invasive measures to identify risk, cardiovascular risk early on. Uh, and it turns out you can do this quite effectively. You can do it based on demographic data. You can do it based on simple morphology. Uh, you know, if you're a teenager and your BMI is 35, you know, there's a lot of things that you can begin to do when behavior is still modifiable. The other thing that actually plays into this is genomics. We've actually, I'm a, I'm a geneticist. I don't believe genomics is ready for prime time in terms of driving care. But what it actually does really effectively is have people get engaged in their care and understand that there are components that are fixed and components that are acquired that will help them move through their trajectory for the next 30, 40, 50 or longer. Um, and so that's how we imagine that happening. The devices that you need in order to do the early diagnosis are also devices that will begin to engage people earlier on. Again, retail chains much, much further along than we are. So one of the retail uh, providers that we're talking to has a plan where they will use uh, essentially discounts on healthy foods, combine that with uh, exercise programs and gym memberships to entrain people for their preventative pharmacies. So, you know, again, asking why would they do that? Well, they're doing it because they see it as part of the economy that is badly managed by us. But the fact is that there's no reason that we couldn't have done this 20, 30 years ago. We've known the information. We just haven't built the systems that let us do that. And, and the, there's no, in fact, not only is there no reason, there's every reason to have organized medicine still involved, but we've almost abdicated our responsibility in so many of these areas that people are just tired of waiting. And I really think, I mean, when you talk to these people, they're like, we spoke to people 30 years ago about this and nobody was interested. And now suddenly, because they're worried that Google or Microsoft or whoever is going to take away all of primary care, suddenly everybody's panicked and we, they want to be involved in these projects. But actually, there's nothing that we're doing now that couldn't have been done 20 years ago. David. <clears throat> Yeah, um, I wonder if you could expand a bit on, on what you described briefly as being the, the delay between um, the, the generation of recommendations and their uptake by the physician community. I mean, yeah. it seems to be an enormously complex problem wherein, for example, in lipid management, you've got three or four sets of guidelines out there. Uh, the, and, and you've got people arguing about them right. <laughs> professionally. Uh, and, and so, so how do you, res who, who's the arbiter of all of these disputes and how do they impose their decision on the physician community? So um, I think that's an excellent question. And, and I mean, I deliberately stayed away from, I, I know I was trying to be provocative, but I deliberately stayed away from the, the hottest hot button issues. So the fundamental problem is that's the academic self-interest. The thing that's driving that is we would far rather spend a decade arguing over the guidelines than just get on and implement the things that we know already 
uh, are, are truly necessary. And it sort of gives people an excuse not to do the things that are worth doing. I think the corollary of that is also that there isn't, there's always this sort of barrier between what happens in the trials and what happens in the real world. And that's a very real barrier. I mean, you know, you know there weren't any 85-year-old ladies in the statin trials, and you see lots of people who are put on a statin, you know, at 80 milligrams because they came in with a little bit of shortness of breath, and they go out on an ACS-level statin, and you see them two or three weeks later, and they can't move because they're so debilitated. So I'm not arguing that we should, you know, drive guidelines to the point where uh, they're essentially um, dominating uh, care. All I'm really saying is that if we had a better system, we could adjust that in real time. We'd actually be doing real world optimization of care. And again, every other industry on the planet has A-B testing in everything that they do. And we just have failed to implement that. We, we would prefer to have us talk about it for a decade than actually implement something and test it in the real world and then optimize it uh, in practice. Reduction to practice is something we do very badly, is essentially what I'm saying. But I think that's largely driven by the haphazard nature of education, professional self-interest, uh, and, um, and also just the lack of a, a real quantitative understanding of how this affects populations. And so that's, a, that's also a discrete balance. How do you balance population effects versus individual effects? Something you can only do if you're recording data on individuals, which we tend not to do. So uh, all, all I'm really saying is I think the, the core elements are all there. We just failed to put them together in a meaningful way that actually leads to changes in outcomes. Thank you so, very much for that wonderful talk, Dr. McRae. Thanks.